ahead and get started this morning. So good morning and welcome to the Northwest Wisconsin Lakes Conference. Thank you for taking time out of a gorgeous day to learn and be inspired with us today. I'm not exactly sure where you're joining from, but here in Ashland, Wisconsin, just a block off of, off of Lake Superior, the sky is baby blue and it's 72 degrees. My name is Mary Jo Jingris and I'm the chairperson of the Northwest Wisconsin Lakes Conference for this year. I work for the Ashland County Land and Water Conservation Department. Today marks our 23rd Northwest Wisconsin Lakes Conference. The first event was held in 1999 and we are fortunate to have hosted consecutive conferences annually ever since then. Although last year was definitely a test as the conference went online at short notice, and our committee had a steep learning curve to navigate exactly what that meant. And then back in 2009, the conference was scheduled to be held at Telemark Resort in Cable, but a few months prior to the event, Telemark closed its doors for good, so we had to scramble to find a new venue and eventually moved the event to Drummond School. Now, today, these years, we rotate every year between Hayward High School and Spooner High School during non-COVID years, of course. And these facilities serve as wonderful venues. Our committee really hopes to be able to see you there in person next year. We made the decision this winter to host today's conference online for the second year in a row. It wasn't an easy decision, but for us, it was the right decision. And this option would not be possible without the help again of Wisconsin Lakes, who hosted our conference last year and did a wonderful job. Maybe you also attended their own fantastic conference online this spring. So I would like to extend a big thank you to Eric Olson and his staff. We greatly appreciate you. And another big thank you goes out to our speakers for being willing and able to present online. Many of them are presenting online for the first time and they coordinated with both our team and the Wisconsin Lakes staff to learn how to make their presentations work in the Zoom format. We also would like to give a shout out to St. Croix Lakes and Rivers Association They've managed our online registrations for several years. They help track all of our numbers. They send out the conference link to you the last two years, and we really appreciate their work. I would also like to thank the 2021 Northwest Wisconsin Lakes Conference Planning Committee. These 16 fine folks have worked together since last October to bring you an amazing suite of presentations today. We have met online monthly, which believe me is no easy task to have reoccurring two hour meetings for eight months in a row. But if you know or speak to any of these folks, please thank them for their service on this committee. A number of them work for county land and water conservation departments, including Caitlin Anderson, with the Polk County Land and Water Conservation Department, Lisa Burns in Washburn County Land and Water, Andy Teal in the Bayfield County Land and Water Conservation Department, Ashley Vandevoort with Douglas County Land and Water, and myself here in the Ashland County Land and Water Conservation Department. We have Linda Anderson and Sandy Swanson with the Washburn County Lakes and Rivers Association, Kathy Erickson from the Wisconsin Lakes Board and the Washburn County Lakes and Rivers Association, Ellen LaFons with Bayfield County Lakes Forum, Diane Dalton with Wisconsin Green Fire, Mike Engelson with Wisconsin Lakes, Tyler Massal and Sherry Snowbank with Wisconsin DNR, Madeline Roberts with the University of Wisconsin Extension, and Jackie Wiggins. So thank you very much to each and every one of you. Your work is greatly appreciated. 
We would also like to thank the following sponsors for this year's conference. And yeah, thank you, Eric. The Long Lake Preservation Association, the Mackenzie Lake Association, all of their logos are noted at the bottom of the screen here. Round Lake Property Owners Association, Bayfield County Lakes Forum, the Lake Owen Association, Sawyer County Lakes Forum, and the Washburn County Lakes and Rivers Association. These organizations will also be listed on the last slide of each presentation. And this conference would not happen without their financial support. And finally, we thank all of you attendees for joining us today. In order to watch the sessions through the Zoom platform, you'll simply click on the enter session that you received in your email link and you can enter the session for whatever presentation you wish to view. The sessions will only be viewable live at the time indicated on your screen. And then recordings will be available later after the conference. Given the large number of attendees we have today, almost 150, all participants will be muted when they enter the presentation. And if you have questions, we would like you to use the Zoom chat function, which is on the bottom of your screen. Um, you will be able to hover, hover over the chat and click on it. And then you can enter your question into the chat box. And the moderator in your session will be relaying them to the presenter. Most of the presenters will be answering questions at the end of their presentation. If you wish to participate with the phone, you'll be calling in and then you use the code information for each stream or presentation session that you're interested in. If a presenter provided handouts for the presentation, you will also notice that um, under the enter session in your email link, there will be a link for a handout. You can simply click on the handout and either download it to your computer or view it. There's also a more information link on that enter session page. And that has more information about the session and the presenters. The online format of our conference today allows sessions to be recorded unless a speaker has requested otherwise. After this conference, you will receive an email with a link to all of the recorded sessions. This will give you a chance to view any of those sessions that you did not have the chance to see today. And this link stays live, so I can actually even go back and view the link from last year to rewatch any of those sessions as well. When the conference is over, you will also receive an evaluation by email. Our planning committee would really appreciate your response because your input helps us make future, future decisions. And we go back and look at these evaluations regularly. Um, we look for speakers, specific speakers or topics. Um, years that we meet in person, we also evaluate our food, the flow of the conference, the venue. And so we really do appreciate any input that you're able to provide. We hope that you enjoy the conference today. Our keynote speaker, Kathy Techman, is with us, and she's going to be beginning here in just a few minutes after our opening remarks are over. So if you need to refill your coffee or take care of anything prior to her presentation, now would be the time. Speaking of coffee, I've had plenty of coffee this morning, so I'm fueled up and ready to go. And although today feels like a gorgeous summer day, I just wanted to remind you that Sunday is actually the first official day of summer, June 20th. It's also Father's Day. So I'd like to say happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. And with that, I have a few fun trivia facts for you. Our trivia today comes from the Wisconsin Lakes Trivia Game Set. Uh, you can find this online if you Google UWSP Extension Lakes Bookstore. 
Uh, they have it for sale. They have a lot of other awesome resources on their website. But if you Google UWSP Extension Lakes Bookstore, you'll be able to purchase this awesome trivia set. And I use this game with my staff um, during lunches, staff lunches. We use it at staff meetings. We use it at a Christmas party. Uh, we use it during intern training and any other time that we need some quick facts for the day. So these are just simply some questions for you to think about at home. Um, we're not going to be doing a challenge here or you're not going to be responding through the chat. Um, I just have a few fun facts for you. So my first question for you this morning is, when do you think that bluegill lay eggs in their underwater nests? What months? When do you think that bluegills lay eggs in their underwater nests? I hear some staff in my office yelling June. And maybe you have some other ideas. So they actually lay eggs from May to August, which is kind of surprising to me because I know the bats are spawning right now or they'll shortly be done. Um, but bluegill lay eggs consistently from May to August. My next question for you is in what year was the first Earth Day celebrated? In what year was the first Earth Day celebrated? I don't hear any of my staff here in my office yelling a year, but the first Earth Day was celebrated in 1970 and Earth Day was founded by Senator Gaylord Nelson, who was the 35th governor of Wisconsin. All right, my next question for you is, what lake insect has four outstretched wings and spends its larval form in the lake eating other insects? What lake insect has four outstretched wings and spends its larval form in the lake eating other insects? The answer is dragonfly. And you may have also thought of a damselfly as they are similar, but I charge you today with looking up both the dragonfly and damselfly online to notice the difference in presentation of their wings. And my final question for you this morning is about seepage lakes. So we have three main types of lakes in Wisconsin, drainage lakes, drained lakes, and seepage lakes. And seepage lakes have no surface inlet or outlet. Therefore, their average water levels are dependent on what two sources of water. Seepage lakes have no surface inlet or outlet. Therefore, their average water levels are dependent on what two sources of water. And if you mentioned groundwater and precipitation, you would be correct. These lakes are highly susceptible to changes in water levels if we have periods of high intense rain or during drought, drought years because they only receive their water from groundwater or precipitation. All right, so that takes care of my fun trivia facts for you this morning. And we are going to go ahead and get started here with Kathy Techman. So Kathy Techman is going to be talking about climate change, uh, game changer or change the game. Kathy is a professor of community resource development and an environmental outreach specialist for the University of Wisconsin Extension in Hurley, Wisconsin just about 45 minutes east of Ashland. She has worked in community economic and leadership development for many, many years. And I actually asked her the other day how long she's been with Extension and I'm highly impressed. She's been with Extension for 38 years. So thank you so much to your service to so many adults and students in the public. Um, that's incredible. 
I, I asked permission if I could tell you all how long she's been with Extension and she agreed to that. So thank you, Kathy. Kathy creates innovative educational programs that make environmental issues come alive for both adults and youth. She directs the Geekanoo, Wizaway Anji Waban, which means guiding for tomorrow, or it's also called GWOW program. This is an initiative that integrates place-based evidence with traditional and scientific econo ecological knowledge to promote climate awareness and action for people of all cultures. As president of Friends of the Gaio Flowage Lake Association and a board member of the Northwoods Land Trust, Kathy is passionate about lakes in Wisconsin. So please help me virtually in welcoming Kathy Techman to our conference as keynote speaker this morning. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mary Jo. Um, thank you everyone for the honor of being the keynote speaker here today. You've got a lineup of some tremendous speakers and uh, I'm very humbled and honored to be a keynote to start you off in a good way. Um, I've known Mary Jo for years. I told her I started with extension when I was five years old. So I just want to preface that. So I'm, today I'm going to share with you something, um, our lakes and climate change, um, game changer. And I stole this tagline from Eric and the lakes uh, program or change the game. And as, uh, as Mary Jo introduced me, I am a state specialist with uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison Extension. I'm also the president of the Friends of the Guile Flowage. You, you can see part of the flowage there. It's about a 3,400 acre uh, impoundment um, in the Hurley area. Uh, it resembles very much the Boundary Waters. Um, so I'm the president of this uh, 501c3 Qualified Lake Association. So thank you for your welcome. Next slide, please. So keeping in the, the uh, theme of uh, the game theme, and climate change really is no game. It's something that's very serious. But keeping within this game, are you all ready to play? Uh, I am, my intention today is to reveal climate change to you in maybe some new ways. I know many of you are very, um, uh, very knowledgeable about this subject, perhaps much more than myself. But I hope to reveal some new ideas about it. I hope to relate climate change to your lake and what you value in your lake. And I hope to provoke you in a good way to take some actions. You can see some different perspectives of climate change on this slide, including the one that my favorite, that global warming is baloney, that the drive through is open. Okay, let's next slide, please. All right, so let's take a look at the global game board. Um, this is kind of our, our run through for today. We're going to start with the Global Game Board. We're going to talk about the game already underway on our northern Wisconsin lakes. We're going to talk about rolling the dice, which will climate change be a game changer for our lakes and who may be winners or losers. And then talking about let's change the game for our lakes. Next slide, please. All right, so just to review, this is going to be a review for many of you, the Global Game Board, taking a look at it. Um, we know that warming is being affected by the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. We're not going to go through all of the science on this stuff, but just kind of think about CO2 like a blanket around our Earth. We need it around our Earth, otherwise our Earth would be an ice ball like many other planets. But when we get too many blankets around our Earth, just like when we're in bed and we get too many blankets, things begin to heat up a little bit too much to be comfortable. And that's what we're basically seeing now with climate change and global warming. The sun's energy is coming in. Some of it, of course, is deflected out to the atmosphere, but more of it is staying being trapped in that thicker blanket uh, caused by greenhouse gases. So we're warming up because of that. Next slide, please. So an important thing to note is that weather and climate are different. And I think most of us know this. Weather is kind of a day-to-day -day thing. We put our finger up in the air, the wind is blowing, it's cold out, we put a sweater on. But climate is weather over a long period of time. And we need to really keep that in mind as we see variations day to day. Is that really climate change or is that weather? So we need to be aware of this. And I'm gonna point this out a little bit more precisely as we go along. Next slide, please. 
So we know that global temperatures are going up and the information I'm using in my presentation is all vetted information from NOAA, uh, NASA, uh, USDA, uh, vetted government sources. So 2016 was the Earth's warmest record since, warmest year on record since we've been keeping records. And 2020 actually tied for the warmest year on record with 2016. So over the baseline that scientists are using is kind of a normal period. Uh, 1951 to 1980, we've uh, gone up about 1.84 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that may not seem like a lot, but if you think of your own personal temperature when you're running a fever, going up a couple degrees can be somewhat significant and globally it certainly is. And you can see the chart there, you can see different sources, different federal sources um, of information and research-based sources on how our, our um, temperatures have increased globally since the, the late 1800s. Okay, next slide, please. What about those pesky polar vortexes? This is one of my favorite slides and I've been keeping tracks over presentations since 2014, but I had to lose those slides because I didn't have enough room on this particular slide. So I started in 2016. You can kind of see the record of polar vortex I. I don't know if that's the correct plural, but record colds through some years. If you, in the Midwest, if you take a look, 2016, 18, 2019, no polar vertex. 2020, we, 20, we had record cold. Uh, 2021, we had record cold in February, then a mild winter. Take a look at the next line though, globally, how temperatures have been increasing. In 2021, we're not sure what's in the books yet for 2021, but it's taking a look like it's gonna be a warm one. But on the bottom, take a look at the CO2 levels. Remember that idea of the blanket getting thicker? So over time, even though we've had these record colds in the Midwest, this polar vortex phenomenon, we've been increasing our CO2 levels globally, and we've also been increasing our temperatures globally over the hottest year records, as you can see. Okay, next slide, please. Another thing we're seeing on the global climate change game board is more extreme storms, more intense rainfall and stronger storms. Um, I, put the hurricane record up on the left, but here in the Midwest, as you can see, our heavy downpours are increasing. And so when you think about it, it makes sense. Increased air temperature, as we saw, means that we have a more juiced up atmosphere with more water vapor being uh, evaporated into it, which means more moisture available during storms and heavier precipitation events, more evaporation back up into the atmosphere. So we have this feedback loop of water vapor, which also serves as a greenhouse gas, but also juices this up so we have more extreme storms happening. And I think we can all think back on some of these extreme storm events that we've been having in Northwestern Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Globally, we see shrinking ice and snow and I need to uh, spell check myself on the word Arctic, I think, but polar ice caps shrink and, and, and grow, but overall decreasing. We see less snow cover globally as well as locally. And we've all heard about the glaciers retreating. One thing I think is really interesting, for those of you who like to follow history and have maybe followed some of the explorations even to the Lake Superior area by Radisson and Grossier and others looking for the famed Northwest Passage across the North American continent. And some of you may even follow some of the Arctic um, explorations of, uh, tra of explorers trying to get that that famed route to Asia through the North American continent through the Northern Passage, that was never possible. They were always stopped by ice. But as of 2007, the Northwest Passage has become a reality. And even cruise ships are using it now on good years. So things are changing in the Arctic area. Next slide, please. Um, those of you who might go to Florida or Gulf Coast states or anywhere on the ocean, you probably are observing that oceans are rising. They're getting warmer. So if you have waterfront property in ocean areas, uh, might be a little concerned. Certainly our insurance companies uh, and FEMA are concerned and you can see that in rising insurance rates and flood insurance rates. Um, we're getting, the causes are melting glacier and land ice, the thermal expansion of waters um, the oceans were the warmest uh, in 20, 2019 and 2020 on record. And what's interesting, I didn't put in this slide, but because oceans absorb so much CO2, if you remember your chemistry, CO2 and water creates what? Carbolic acid. And that's causing a bleaching of our coral reefs. 
So we don't have coral reefs here in the, in the Midwest, but it certainly is affecting the entire ecosystem of our oceans, of shell fishing, of, of the sustainability of ocean ecosystems. So this is another indicator that we are seeing global warming on a, on a, on a, on a, through the oceans. Next slide, please. Haven't we played this game before? You know, haven't we been here before? Well, not really. Um, there's been times when CO2 levels have been higher, certainly not within recorded history. And as you can see from this chart from NASA, um, you can see how the, the global temperatures have increased and decreased. There's a lot of uh, reasons for this, volcanic eruptions, other things that have happened. But our current level is at records high, record high. So we're in kind of new territory right now certainly since we humans have been around. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about Northern Wisconsin lakes. The game has already begun. We're, we're arriving a little late here. How do we know that the game has already begun here on our lakes? We're gonna take a look at some place-based evidence as well as some science-based evidence. Next slide, please. Okay, place-based evidence uh, is something that we can observe. And as we talked about earlier, and I know most of us have experienced, we've had a series of extreme storm events in Northwestern Wisconsin that are really unprecedented. I hate to use the word 100 and 500 year floods because sometimes that's overused, but we've had at least 20 100 year floods in this last decade from 2011 to 2020. And that's from the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts or WIKI. And I'm going to be referring to Wiki in future slides, so the Wiki. So I think all of us remember the disruption and the tremendous amount of damage here in Iron County where I live. Our harbor, Saxon Harbor, was completely destroyed with the loss of one life. By the way, it was just rededicated in a very nice ceremony about a week ago. And, and thank you for any of you who attended and supported that, especially to our legislators who are attending today. Thank you very much for your support and help. We've also had other incidents of place-based evidence. Uh, for example, tribal rice harvest, wild rice harvest, disrupted um, from 2010 to 2018 from flooding, drought, disease, unprecedented in tribal history. Um, no one had ever experienced that before. And this is a culture that dates back on the land much longer than many of us. Uh, we see things like increases of blue-green algae outbreaks on northwestern Wisconsin lakes and Lake Superior that have really never happened before. Again, warmer temperatures are exacerbating uh, these types of, uh, of, of occurrences that we can observe. And these are just a few. I think that you can think about some that you're seeing in your lakes as well. Next slide, please. We have things such as phenological evidence. Uh, Aldo and Nina Leopold journal observations, and I just gave you a slice here of bird migration. Some of you might be birders and might be nodding your heads. Yes, you're seeing some changes in bird migration. Changes in when spring occurs and when fall starts. Next slide, please. Now the USDA is not really a great, um, not necessarily what you would call a tree hugger organization, uh, if I could use that term, but take a look at what's happened to our hardiness, our plant hardiness growing zones from 1990, 2012, and I put the arrow on kind of our area of Northwestern Wisconsin to 2018 we've gone up or we've warmed by an entire growing zone. So again, we're seeing the USDA adjusting for these warming trends that are happening within the United States and globally. Next slide, please. But we need to use care when we're using place-based evidence. Is it really weather that we're seeing or is it climate change? And I add this slide because this is some research that was very, um, very compelling out of um, Canada where they surveyed local residents on whether or not they thought they were seeing climate change. And indeed, it wasn't clear whether it was weather that they were observing, uh, the weather variability, kind of those up and down changes seasonally and daily, or it was climate change. So we need to use a little bit of care when we use place-based evidence to say, yes, climate change is really happening. Next slide, please. So how can we, how, what can help us with evaluating our place-based evidence? And I would suggest we can incorporate traditional ecological knowledge of our indigenous communities that can help us evaluate evidence of climate change that we're seeing. Why? Because indigenous cultures, such as the Ojibwa culture here in Northwestern Wisconsin, um, has traditional knowledge of natural systems and also language that goes back for generations and gives us a really long-term 
place-based indicator of climate change beyond weather variability that we might be seeing in our cultures. Next slide, please. Where do we get to where can we get traditional ecological knowledge? An excellent source that has recently come out, which is research based, is the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission's Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment. This is the first volume that you see on the screen here. This is one chart that comes out of that research that gives the vulnerability of selected beings or species. And there are there's more details and more beings or species indicated in the report. I put the link there so that you could find this. It's online and available free of charge to everyone. And this is based on interviews with um, traditional ecological knowledge holders, language speakers, and elders. Uh, and it's very helpful in giving uh, another look at place-based evidence of climate change. And we're gonna be incorporating this into some of our investigations in just a bit. Next slide, please. We can also take a look at scientific evidence as well. And I want to just say that indigenous knowledge is also scientific, but for the purposes of this, this presentation, we're going to call this academic science or scientific evidence. We have historic evidence, evidence that's already in the books, that's already been reported. And here are two examples. This is from the new wiki um, data and I have, or new wiki maps that have just been published. And I have a link coming up in future slides that you can go and take a look at all of these maps. They're very helpful in understanding how Wisconsin climate has changed in the past and is projected to change in the future. The two maps there are annual daily temperature that's already been recorded from 1950 to 2018. We've seen about a two to three increase overall temperatures in Wisconsin, but the greatest warming in Northern Wisconsin and Northwestern Wisconsin. And if we take a look at just for, I just put up the winter daily temperature change, look at how much more we're going to be warming in Northwestern Wisconsin or how much we've warmed already, I should say in Northwestern Wisconsin. This is already in the books and this is warming that we've seen. And I think that you can think back on some of the changes that you've maybe seen in some of the winter activities that you enjoy. Uh, some of the variability that we've had in our temperatures. So most uh, of our warming has been most significant during the winter months as of our recorded warming. Next slide, please. We can also take a look at projected scientific evidence from climate projection models. So again, this is coming from Wiki and I put the link on the, on below their logo over on the left. So you can go and look at all of their climate maps both historic and projected. They're very helpful. This one I chose just for fun. This is days uh, per year with maximum temperatures above 90 degrees. The map on the left is the historic number of days above 90 degrees that Wisconsin has seen between uh, 1980 and what, 1981 and 2010. And if you take a look on the right side, these are the number of days uh, over 90 degrees that are projected in by mid-century, which is the range between 2041 and 2061. Mid-century is really important to use because oftentimes we think of climate change way in the future. It's not going to be affecting me or my grandkids. It's something in the future. It's something distance. It, this is by mid-century. Many of us will still be around. Many of you will still be around. And certainly your grandchildren and our children will still be around. It, great increase in number of days uh, above 90 degrees. And we've been seeing some recently, haven't we? Weather variability or climate change, this time will tell. I also want to make note that the climate projections that are used by Wiki and in my presentation today are all based on a middle of the road climate model scenario. It's called the RCP 45. And it basically means we kind of keep using fossil fuels and doing what we're doing kind of middle of the road climate scenario, doing what we're doing into the future. And as you can see, it does still increase our global warming into the future. There are other more extreme um, climate scenarios that maybe are, you know, will give different projections or models. And there are some that are lower that mean that we really drastically reduce our fossil fuel use and carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. But we chose to use the middle of the road one because we felt that it was the most conservative one to use for the purposes of, of outreaching this information. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is projected by mid-century? Well, here's a couple of maps from the new wiki projections. Average uh, annual temperature changes of about three to seven degrees. And you can see the, on the left side, the temperature projection map by mid-century. 
And I also chose again, um, this is the map we just saw, which were the very hot days above 90 degrees, which indicates drought and a lot of stress both on our lakes and our terrestrial systems. About 20 more days of hot days projected. Uh, next slide, please. Warmer winters. So we talked about this already. Warmer winters are projected, especially in Northwestern Wisconsin, about seven degree uh, Fahrenheit change. You might say, wow, that's great. It's not gonna be so darn cold. Um, there may be some other considerations that we need to think about when, when warmer winters are being projected, especially the decrease of cold nights. Um, the map uh, with the maps, the two maps that are paired below, the nights below uh, minimum, temperatures below zero, the map on the left are historic, is, is historic data, the number of nights below zero. Look at the change and the difference between the map on the left, which is historic, what we've already experienced and what we've been experiencing, to what is projected by mid-century, a significant change in the decrease of cold nights. Again, you might say, oh, that's awesome. But there is some serious ramification for our lakes in that. So there's gonna be less ice cover on our lakes, more evaporation. And because of warming temperatures, we're going to be seeing more of our winter precipitation coming as rain and not snow. Next slide, please. Speaking of precipitation, Wisconsin is generally going to be wetter, but with more extreme weather. So we're gonna get about a 5% increase in precipitation. The greatest increases are gonna be in winter and spring. And I put up the winter map. I just didn't have room to put up the winter and spring map on this slide. But again, you can go to the wiki maps and investigate these for yourself. These are projected increases in, um, in precipitation. You can see how Northern Wisconsin is going to be affected uh, by these projections. Again, more rain is gonna be falling as rain or sleet rather than snow in the winter time. And we're gonna see a frequency of two inch or greater rainfall events. And we've already been seeing that in our place-based evidence. So we're seeing the syncing up of both place-based evidence and scientific evidence here as we, as we meld these two ways of knowing. Next slide, please. So I stole this slide or this graphic from Madeline McGee, who is gonna be one of your presenters today. And I know that she's gonna do an, a wonderful, wonderful session. So temperature is really the ecological master factor for our lakes, it affects oxygen levels, it affects the reproduction and growth and uh, species in our lakes, invasives, um, the food chain, and also nutrient cycling. So these climatic variables like temperature um, and also precipitation, drought, and intensive storm events affects our lakes and what we value in our lakes. And we're gonna be taking the look, kind of drilling down on this now. Next slide, please. So we're gonna to advance to go in our game here. I'm gonna challenge you to think about climate change differently using this kind of framework to play our game or to think about our game. This is also a framework for communicating to others about climate change. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Let's think about how climate change is affecting the species and habitats that support activities we value based on place-based evidence we can observe with scientific evidence. And then what moves can we do to, uh, to, to change the game. So if you think about in this slide, the fisher who is interested in brook trout fishing, that activity relies on the sustainability of brook trout, of course. And what habitats do brook trout need? Cold, oxygen-rich uh, waters. What do you think, based on the climate mapping that I showed you, projections and place-based evidence, what do you think is happening to the sustainability of those habitats and that species? And how will that affect this activity? Next slide, please. Okay, so we're ready to roll the dice. Who might be climber winners and losers on our lakes? Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through a series of slides. We're going to kind of visually uh, weave together these different ways of knowing about climate change, place-based um, and uh, scientific evidence-based. We're gonna look at some activities that you might value or your families might value in your lakes. And the first one we're gonna look at is walleye fishing. I think something that many of us really prize in our Northwestern Wisconsin lakes. And what is the species and habitat that, rely, that we rely on for walleye fishing? Well, of course, our walleye or oga in the Ojibwe language. Uh, walleye are a cool water uh, species. They like cool water habitats. But as our lakes are warming, we're seeing some transitions. This, this chart may be difficult for you to see, but this is based on research by the US Geological Survey 
that shows Wisconsin trends in lakes between uh, walleye populations and largemouth bass populations. And those of you who know about largemouth bass, largemouth bass like warmer waters, right? So we're seeing in some of our lakes a, a switch or a change in or conversion of species uh, being dominated, some of our lakes being dominated now more by largemouth bass versus walleye. We take a look at that's place-based evidence of change that we're seeing. If we take a look at the um, scientific evidence of how the climate variables affecting the habitat that walleye need could be changing, we're seeing warming temperatures of in Wisconsin, especially northern Wisconsin. Um, so as lakes get warmer, as the U.S. Geological Survey suggests, there could be conversion of some of our lakes that we value for walleye fishing to largemouth bass. Is this bad? On my lake, we have bass fishermen and walleye fishermen, and there's a kind of a, um, a, a little uh, competition, a friendly competition between both of them. But the U.S. Ge Geological Survey's research says that many lakes that currently support natural walleye populations are unlikely to continue to have the thermal habitat conditions to do so. So we may see some conversion in this. If you're a walleye fisherman, would this make the issue of climate change come alive to you? Very possibly. Let's take the next slide. We aren't going to have a, a chance to go through this, uh, person, but I would encourage you to take a look at this visualization that's provided by the U.S. Geological Survey. The link is there that you'll be able to access. Um, and you can read the quote from the Geological Survey as I'm speaking, but this uh, interactive map will allow you to go to your lake and you'll be able to visualize whether the Geological Survey, based on mid-century climate projections, um, suspect that your lake may be converting to a more warmer water fishery. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at another activity, uh, wild rice harvesting or manumen uh, in the Ojibwe language. Some of you may harvest wild rice, certainly a very cultural uh, important activity for the Ojibwe tribal uh, nations here. The species and habitat that this activity relies on, of course, is manumen or wild rice, which requires shallow water, moderate water level changes, and cool growing season conditions. Here I've shared with you one of the GLIFWIC or Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission climate vulnerability charts, and I've circled the Newman, and you can see on that chart, according to traditional knowledge keepers, the Newman is highly vulnerable to climate change based on traditional ecological knowledge. Just as one environmental variable that we've seen changes, we've seen increased flooding of wild rice areas that has affected wild rice harvesting. This happens to be the Bad River Kakagan Sluice, but we've seen flooding in other areas. And if we take a look at what academic science is projecting could change in terms of flood events of two inch or more rainfall events, we see an increase in Northwestern Wisconsin. So how will climate change affect the sustainability of wild rice? And what does this mean for cultural practices that rely on manumen? Next slide, please. Here's another fishing related activity. Um, this happens to be fishing on a river system and the invasive species, uh, Asian carp, or you could kind of fill in the blank there with other uh, aquatic invasives, which tend to be um, uh, adaptable to warmer water habitats and lower oxygen habitats. We're seeing evidence of increasing numbers of invasive species, Asian carp, infecting our river systems and some of our lake systems to the south of us. Again, place-based evidence. If we take a look at that, that climate annual average temperature in the map for Wisconsin, we see increases in temperatures. So this will make these habitats much more conducive to invasive species like Asian carp and could really affect the sustainability of these species. So in this case, a climate winner. Next slide, please. Activity we all love at our lakes and I'm sure many of us will do on a hot day today is go swimming in our lakes. We value our cool, clear, clean lakes but unfortunately, we are seeing an influx of invasive uh, aquatic invasive plant species, Eurasian water milfoil and some others. They can tolerate a wide range of temperature conditions, much like our invasive fish species and low oxygen conditions. What evidence are we seeing of more invasion by these aquatic invaders? Well, 
I never thought we'd see weed harvesters in northern Wisconsin, but we do see them on our lakes. This was something that was almost reserved for small lakes in, in southern Wisconsin, like Okachi Lake. Um, but weed harvesters and weed issues in northern Wisconsin lakes, perhaps some of you are dealing with this. And again, I'm using our good old annual average temperature uh, map for Wisconsin by mid-century to suggest that higher air temperatures equals higher water temperatures, which favors invasives and algae blooms. Next slide, please. Another activity, sitting by our lakes or just enjoying being by our lakes. Um, you may have noticed that mosquito populations seem to be on the rise in some places. So our state bird, uh, its habitat, it requires water for breeding. Warm temperatures encourage more rapid generational development. So are we seeing evidence of more mosquito populations around the state? Yes, and we're seeing evidence of new species of mosquitoes that carry different diseases coming into our state. And if so, we have some place based evidence there. We also have suggestion that increases in spring precipitation will create habitat conditions favorable for mosquitoes. However, in talking with uh, uh, um, an, uh, uh, a disease, uh, an insect disease person down at Madison, um, I asked about the future for mosquitoes in Wisconsin. And she said, the, the future is mixed here. We'll be getting warmer and wetter springs and conducive for mosquitoes. But Remember, we're also going to be getting more storm events that could wash away uh, breeding populations and disrupt their spread. So the, the, the message here is mixed. We'll have to see which, uh, what happens with our mosquitoes, but hopefully there'll be less. Next slide, please. Here's an activity, Project Loon Watch. Maybe you just love seeing loons and it's probably a little hard to see, but that lady with her binoculars up is looking at that little dot in the lake that you may or may not be able to see, a loon. Certainly loons are one of our iconic species in our northern Wisconsin lake that we just value for their beauty and just their calls. I mean, they're just part of the north woods, aren't they? And so this being, this species needs shoreline nesting habitats with stable to moderate water level fluctuations. They also, uh, also an issue that's been happening is warmer temperatures increase black fly predation on the chicks. So we see evidence, place-based evidence of, of black fly predation and abandoned nests uh, of our loons. But, and if we take a look at academic science and how climate variables affecting loons and their habitats may be changing. Again, we see that the issue of um, these storm events that could wash nests away, as well as warmer summer daily average temperatures, which could encourage black fly predation. And the Audubon Society has indicated that they feel it looks all but certain that Minnesota, and I would say probably Northwestern Wisconsin is pretty close too, will lose its iconic loons by in, by the, uh, in summer, by the end of mid-century, by the end of the century. So that's pretty alarming um, that we could lose our loons, that they may have to move on farther north in order to find sustainable habitat. Next slide, please. Let's switch to winter. Um, so winter habitats. Um, Here's a situation where we don't have a, a species or being, but we simply have a habitat, an activity that we all enjoy, maybe snowmobiling. You could substitute down skiing or snowboarding here um, or ice fishing too. I have room on this slide, but winter activities that require snow or ice uh, as the habitat for supporting it. What are we seeing as evidence of change? Well, I think we can all agree we've seen some uh, a great variation in our snowfalls in safe ice conditions over the last number of years. Um, if we take a look at, again, I'm using the double uh, uh, climate maps here. The climate map on the left is the historic uh, number of days that are below 32, below freezing. And the map on the right is what's projected by mid-century. You can see that we are going to have a decrease in the number of nights below freezing. So unfrozen lakes, as we know, lose more water to evaporation uh, during the winter and warm faster during the spring. This can decrease levels of oxygen um, in the water. It can also uh, it, uh, favor invasive species, uh, invasive aquatic plant growth, and is potentially harmful for algal blooms. Next slide, please. So that's, those are just a few examples. And you can think of your own, but I, this is a different way to think about climate change and a different way to communicate about it, to really relate it to people, what they value, how to reveal it in different ways using place-based evidence that they can observe or stories they can tell about what they've seen, where you can weave in some scientific evidence or tell your story. 
but how can we change the game for our lakes? What can we do? And many of the things that we can do are just good lake stewardship that builds resiliency to climate change, but also helps improve the health of our lakes. Next slide, please. So here's a game changer. And some of these you're probably already working on. Be prepared, the old Girl Scout and Boy Scout motto for extreme weather events, because they are coming. They've already come and there's gonna be more in the future. So make your lake infrastructure and your lake property climate ready. An example is replacing culverts around your lake. And you may have to work with your town or your lake association or lake district to do this, but we know we're gonna be getting increased water flows due to storm events. We can protect stream habitat and fish habitat as well as public safety by planning ahead when we make these improvements. You may wanna plan your riparian development to accommodate changing lake levels because as we know, we're gonna have more extreme weather events which may raise lake levels. We may have more evaporation in the winter time or more drought that might lower them. So we're gonna have some variability and fluctuation here. Floating docks might be a, a, a solution, it might be an adaptation for that to increase your resiliency. And then just being prepared for weather emergencies, having a plan, both a personal plan and maybe even a lake plan of what you'll do in case of, of these extreme weather events, which are already in the pipeline. Next slide, please. Slow the flow is a game changer and you all are familiar with this, I know. Reduce the impervious uh, surfaces and, re and divert runoff into your lake. I know you're all familiar with lake shore rain gardens and rock infiltration to reduce erosion. This helps to capture and divert the flow from these intense rainstorms that reduces flooding and erosion and sedimentation into your lake. Uh, this preserves your property values as well and reduces the flow of nutrients and pollutants into your lake. Remember, your lakes are going to be under stress already. They don't need more stressors coming into them. And this is something that we can do. It's our responsibility as lake owners and, and, and lovers of lakes to help with. This also helps retain natural landscape aesthetics of our North Woods. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Next slide, please. Reducing stress on your lake that I just mentioned, another game changer. So we know warmer temperatures could mean earlier spawning of our, our, our fish species in our lakes, changing fish dynamics, conversions possibly as lakes warm from walleye to bass and other species. The issue of invasives also being able to tolerate these warmer conditions and loss of habitats. So if we can try to cool and enhance uh, our habitats within our lakes, we can perhaps um, increase our resiliency of our fish populations by encouraging like near shore aquatic vegetation and onshore vegetation that will shade the water. Um, a couple of these are fish ticks habitat, which are dropping um, trees, trees into lakes to create shade and habitat for fish and adding more coarse woody debris or CWD. And both of these do require DNR permits, but, and I think some of your lake associations are already doing this. We're doing this on the Friends of the Gile Flowage um, through our lake association. So again, this helps to reduce stress on our, on our fish species by helping to protect some high quality fish habitats. Next slide, please. And another game changer, don't pee in your lake or I would say N in your lake. So I'm referring to phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, warming temperature coming from fertilizers that we use on our lake properties. Um, warming temperatures plus nutrients is going to equal growth of invasive plants and blue-green algae. So we can trap P, which is phosphorus, and N, nitrogen, and other nutrient-laden runoff using natural vegetation buffers. Again, these have been stressed for years through the lakes program, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, between our lake lawns and the water. Um, and when you're fertilizing your lake lawn, you're not just fertilizing your lawn. Unless you have those buffers, you're fertilizing the lake as well, kind of like this guy in the picture. So when at all possible, reduce your fertilizer and your pesticide use because runoff will push that water down into your lake and it'll affect your lake habitats. And I would also challenge us to help, our, help ourselves and those in our lake associations help make the mental shift from what's becoming kind of an urbanized lake lawn culture to the more natural Northwoods vegetation. Um, I know many people that come to the lakes up here bring with them more of a suburban lawn mindset. If we can help through gentle education to encourage that Northwoods vegetation to keep our Northwoods lakes, Northwoods lakes. Next slide, please. 
stopping the spread. Of course, we talked about this already, warming temperatures and favors and bases. Uh, many can overwinter in warmer northern lakes, so I'm sure most of you have an aquatic invasive awareness program to engage boaters and anglers and other uh, lake users. Here on the Guile Flowage, we have the, um, uh, I guess, the notoriety of being the first inland lake in Wisconsin to have spiny water fleas. So these are already showing up in many northern Wisconsin lakes, and they're also in southern Wisconsin lakes now. So we try to do boater education to help our, help prevent the guile flowage from being a vector to spreading this invasive to other lakes around us. Monitor your lake for invasives. More invasives are on their way. So we need to develop a rapid response plan for new invaders, working with our partners in the land conservation departments and in the DNR um, to monitor and then take action quickly because they will spread quickly, especially with warming temperatures and reduce new potential pathways for aquatic invasives to enter our lake, including non-motorized boaters. Most of us don't think that kayak users also and other paddle boarders can also spread invasives on their watercraft or their bow and stern lines. So to make sure that we, we educate our non-motorized boaters as well as our motorized boaters, how they can help reduce the spread. Next slide, please. This is an old, oldie but goodie again, buffer ourselves, shoreline buffering. It has to do with that vegetation buffer we talked about earlier. But I, in this context, I'm talking about increased storm events will impact our lake infrastructure and our shorelines and properties. So by using those native shoreline buffers, we can reduce that erosion and sedimentation again. This also provides habitat, that critical habitat and reduces stress for fish, amphibians, birds and wildlife reduces that runoff and give, keeps that high water quality for swimming. Remember the slide of swimming? We wanna keep that high water quality. And again, it maintains those natural aesthetics versus an urban lake landscape. And those of you who remember uh, Bob Corth, bless his heart, he would always say, edit your shoreline. Edit your shoreline instead of simply clear cutting your shoreline or putting lawns down to the lake edge. Less lawn means less fossil fuel use in your lawnmower, which means less CO2. So one way to help um, stop climate change, less CO2 use, but also it's more time to enjoy your lake when you're not having to mow such a huge lawn. Let the natural vegetation do its work. Next slide, please. And this is the biggest game changer is you. And this is what I really would like to leave you with today as you're listening to all the other wonderful speakers that are coming after me who are experts in their field is thinking about what you can do. It's up to us to take action. It's our responsibility as lovers of lakes, as members of lake associations. And I would suggest sometimes an issue like climate change seems just so overwhelming, like what on earth can we do? We're just single people, we've been told that our little actions won't really mean much. And indeed, we're going to need global action to turn global warming around. But it doesn't mean that we're powerless. We can, we can all do something. We are all equipped with a mouth and some ears. And communication is taking action on climate change. The more we communicate about climate change with others and normalize this terminology and talk about ways of becoming more resilient, resilient, the more this message will spread through our lake community and our communities at large. Communication is action. There's some wonderful uh, research done by Yale Communication that I didn't have time to put up on my screens, but you can, re you can Google it. And they've done a lot of market segmentation on climate change. And you can actually drill down to your county to find out uh, what percentage of the population believes that climate change is actually happening and what percentage of, of the population has different opinions about it. Across Wisconsin, about 70% of the state feels that global warming is actually happening. And that's increased and that's a good thing. I mean, yes, it's happening. Most people don't think that it's affect them personally. And most people think that it's sometimes in the future. But the key piece that I want to bring to you is only about less than 30 some percent in most of our counties, some as low as 20 or below, communicate or talk about climate change occasionally. So if it's out of sight, out of mind, people are not going to take action. So this is something we all, you all, we can all do to engage our friends, our neighbors, our lake association members in, in respectfully talking about this. Remember, you are trusted messengers with them. Uh, 
even sometimes even folks from you know state or federal agencies, maybe even myself, will not be a trusted member, but messenger, but you are. You are a Lake Association member. Maybe you're a Lake Association president, as I am. You're a trusted messenger. You can bring and communicate these messages to them. You can use the model that I showed you by integrating place-based evidence that they've observed with academic science and weaving in maybe even traditional ecological knowledge to get them to think about this in a different way of how climate change affects what people value. That's what's important. That makes the message stick. And talking about how to increase the resiliency. How do we, how do we become prepared? Um, listen to their observations and be prepared to tell your own climate story, weaving together those ways of knowing. And then stress opportunities and actions to change the game and to help lakes we love. And any step forward, what is that old saying? A journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Communication is one of those. Just encourage people to talk to others about it. And that will help us down that path to helping the lakes that we love. Next slide, please. There are some great tips and tools in this resource from the Wisconsin Lakes uh, Healthy Lakes program that I would highly encourage you to get a copy of and share with your members. Um, there are many, many tips and tools that, that, are, uh, that I couldn't cover in this short presentation today, but this is an excellent resource and I really appreciate those who put this together. Next slide, please. And so this is my thank you or miigwech in the Ojibwe language for uh, inviting me as your keynote. I hope I've started this wonderful day for you in a good way for the many talented speakers who are coming after me. So thank you very much again. I appreciate it. And thank you, Kat, uh, for sharing all these ideas. I do want to point out just sort of as the Zoom host here, we have the um, chat box open. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, the next sessions don't start until 1030, um, but we do have time for Q&A here as we close out. I know a lot of information was sent your way and Mary Jo can help moderate this as well. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for questions in the chat, so go ahead and post those down. There was one comment saying contact your elected representative, be sure to vote. Um, Mary Jo, do you want to handle this question about rain gardens? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we do have a question. What is a good resource for rain gardens? And there was a new publication that was just um, developed for that. Oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Do you know that, Kathy? Um, Extension has some, no, I don't know the publication, but I think the Learning Store uh, through UW Extension has, um, has publications on rain gardens. The most recent one I'm not familiar with. I think also our land conservation departments would have information on rain gardens, correct? Yes, um, no, there is a it. new manual that just came out recently. I'm actually trying to find a link to it real quick online. But your local land and water conservation departments do have a number of resources on rain gardens and many departments in the state are also able to design rain gardens for landowners. I know we do that here in Ashland County. Um, so contact your county land and water conservation department and they may have a manual available for you. And, and we did get some links in the chat. If you click on those links, they'll open up in a browser window. If you're concerned about, you can bookmark those. You can just sort of temporarily save them. You don't have to bookmark them forever, but it just allows you to come back to them. Um, so there's a couple of different uh, links related to rain gardens. People jumped on that pretty quick. Um, one person back up, uh, Barb Luck had a question about a study that Kat mentioned uh, at the very end about the percent of people acknowledging climate change as existence. She's wondering who did that. So I might try to click back to the slide, but do you, Kat, do you remember this one? Yes, yes. I mentioned it as in the communication slide and I did not put the resource up there. It's Yale, the, it's Yale University, Yale University Climate Change. If you Google that, um, Yale Climate Communications, they have done, they have just a very robust website that has a number of some, a number of very interesting 
um, climate change market research studies. Um, their most, probably their most famous one was, I think one of the first ones they came out with was called the Six Americas, which uh, looked at American attitudes on climate change and found that kind of there was almost like six, six market segments from people who were extremely alarmed to people who were dismissive about it. And then they did market studies of the characteristics or demographics of those, of those different populations uh, and the range. And what's interesting is they followed up on that initial research of how those opinions have changed over time. They have just a huge number of research studies that are all vetted, it's through Yale University. Um, the Yale communication, there is an interactive visualization map that you can find. And someone I'm sure who is one of our Wranglers can find that link. I just can't talk and do that at the same time, I apologize. Um, but there is an interactive link where you can look at the opinion visualization map and you can see the United States and you can drill down to state level data, congressional level data, um, uh, in some case, or county level data, and in some case, even municipal data in terms of different questions about climate change that were posed to people, in, including, um, do you think climate global warming is happening? Um, is it going to affect you? Is it gonna affect future generations? It is affecting people in other countries. Um, does Congress need to do more on it? There's just a huge number of questions that were asked. It's a very, thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for putting that, that in the chat. Um, it's really interesting and it's very thought provoking. And the, the one that really strikes me is that Many people now, the needle has really moved to people thinking that global warming is happening. However, they don't really think it's gonna affect them or you know, it's gonna affect way in the future, which we know from our climate projections, it's here and it's affecting us now. Those opinions sometimes prevent people from taking action because it's not here and now. It also is not something that is gonna affect um, activities or economics that, value, that they value, which we have seen that it will. Um, but then if you take a look at communicating about climate change, it's the numbers fall way down. And you can see both in the visualization of the colors of the map, but then also the percentages of people surveyed what they said. So people are not communicating about climate change. And I like to, I like to give this the, the analogy, those of you who have seen Harry Potter movies, remember the, the bad guy is he who will not be named and nobody ever names him. So everybody's like, ooh, he will not be named. Climate change is kind of, I kind of make that analogy here. So by not naming or talking about it, it kind of stays in the background as this hidden thing ready to address. So as we know, when there's an issue or something, even in health, when we know what something is and we can name it, we can address it. We can, and, and that to me is huge. And that's why communication, I think, is a huge action piece that sometimes we overlook. Um, and again, it's something that we can all do. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, so the, uh, the rain garden booklet that was just mentioned is, um, this booklet right here. And there is a link to that in the chat. Um, we will also post these links that were mentioned on the Northwest Wisconsin Lakes, uh, website. Another great resource for landowners would be this book, um, controlling runoff and erosion for your waterfront property. I did post the link for this in the chat as well, and that will also be posted on our website. 